here today. Walking up this stair, I felt a little like I felt about 20 years ago when my, direct, my advisor, uh, trying to duck giving a lecture on classification of diabetes, encouraged me to do it. He said, this will be my biggest break. And uh, so I worked about four or five months on it. And as I was talking, I had this terrible feeling that I was an illegitimate child at a family reunion. And when the lights finally went on, there was no one there left. So I said, I hope this doesn't happen the same way that it did 20 years ago. What I uh, am most happy about, and this was a topic Dr. Reed assigned me, uh, is that I, I came away very hopeful with the classification that we now are all becoming uh, and are trying to recognize. A very easy classification that's been brought up by Dr. Warner in a, in a superb analogy of a solid brick wall and Apache brick wall and uh, Gene's classification, which is about the same, but to give formal terminology to it, and to take home just a couple of points from this talk, and that is the KI-67, which is a proliferative marker, which many of you come in to our clinic and say, my proliferation marker is very high. I, ha I am very depressed. And you all know proliferation marker, but it's become a very important and useful tool I have one reference uh, that I'll go into a bit of detail to show it to you, then to show you the pitfalls of staining, and then to open up the avenues and the direction for therapeutic options, which uh, immunohistomorpho functionality offers us. And um, my abstract is, did, didn't quite make it because I didn't send it in in time, but we have one and I hope you get that. And I have handouts as we speak being printed in, uh, in lecture form. So uh, if you just enjoy, uh, then we'll uh, have the handouts hopefully by the break. Uh, I'd like to go back, as Dr. Jean alluded to, I felt my ears burning when I was in the restroom and it was uh, that 3,000 year old comment. But what I'd like to share with you is on this slide, which I've had for a long time, is something very, very important. Yeah, that's way back there. What I want to share on this slide is the evolution of gut endocrine medical therapy. And it really began with the physiologist. We'll talk to Oberndorfer in a few moments and Fertig in a few moments. But something very important happened in 1960. It was the discovery or the identification or the description of the radioimmunoassay by Saul Burson and Rosalind Yallow. And the other most important thing about that was that uh, that became a later the, a, a Nobel Prize for Raj Yallow. Saul Burson had died and you can't get the Nobel Prize posthumously. But in actual fact, she received it for the development of the RIA and somatostatin, which was described in 1973 by Brazeau and Guillemin, along with Shalley, received the Nobel Prize in 1978. Most important, there are two things on that slide I'd show you as well. Insulin in 1921 from Toronto, Ontario, Banning and Best, uh, I have stabilized insulin. That was so important a discovery in the stabilization of insulin. It represented the first time a hormone was given back. That received a Nobel Prize by Banning and McLeod from Toronto, Ontario. So now we have a Nobel Prize for insulin, an intro pancreatic neuroendocrine peptide in 1921. We have the Nobel Prize awarded for the identification of the radioimmunoassay, which set into play the whole staining phenomenon the ability to antigen, use an antigen and raise an antibody and then go back and stain substances, specific substances, and to measure them by radioimmunoassay. And all of immunostaining has come from that discovery. And then we have the, the discovery or the stabilization of octreotide in 1980 by Janos Pless and 50 of his people in Sandos, now Novartis. And they received the Nobel Prize of Industry which is the Pre-Galleon Award. It was for Obendorfer in 1907, alluded to uh, earlier uh, today, uh, that coined the term carcinoid, which uh, means cancer-like. And it was to describe the very insidious, slow-growing, not quite normal nature of carcinoid. 
What happened, though, uh, sh shortly thereafter, was the discovery or the identification of the Helitzalen cell, the clear cell, by Dr. Friedrich, Professor Friedrich Ferter from Austria. He was looking at the stains, the silver stains, the argenophon stains that were available, mason uh, stains, and he recognized that in the bowel and in the pancreas there were cells that had different characteristics than the mucosal cells of the intestinal tract. Being a, t a typical Austrian German, he said something to the effect of Mein Gott, das ist eine Helizelle. So this is the clear cell that he was talking about. And this is the picture of what I think he saw. And this site was given to me many years ago by my colleague and friend Stephen Qualman, who uh, trained here in uh, Toronto, Ontario, uh, uh, for, at the children, uh, Hospital for Sick Children. It's a neuroblastoma cell. And it helped me more than any to understand what Ferter said when he was talking about these cells that become uh, aggressive, that can that become tumors, first tu uh, tumors and then carcinoma, as was, as was alluded to by Dr. Warner. And on there, I've, I've muted it a little bit. I've put the receptors, because that concept of receptors on this cell makes regulation uh, uh, the, the, the key word. It makes somatostatin the key, the key uh, neuropeptide that acts as a key to fit into those locks and control the tumor growth. And it's those receptors on these cells and their respective tumors and carcinomas that offer us hope. That is the stain of uh, neuron-specific analase, which is no longer used by the pathologist because of its non-specificity. But those are granules inside the cell. And it helps to give the essence of neuroendocrineness to these cells. You can see the clear area around the nucleus. That's a very rich Golgi apparatus. And it's that which synthesizes the peptides that Gene alluded to in different organs of the body. In the in pancreas, it can make insulin, glucagon, pancreatic polypeptide, and somatostatin. They can make gastrin when they're a tumor. They can make uh, serotonin, the amines. They can make norepinephrine, the amine. But this is the cell that Ferter, uh, that Ferter was alluding to. Now to wit, the, uh, the KI-67 uh, is a very, very important tumor marker. It's been written up widely uh, in the European literature. And this is probably one of the best papers that I have found on it from 1993 by McCormick and Chong. And they demonstrated that MIB1, which is interchanged with KI67, is an excellent, robust marker of cell proliferation, easily applicable to archival material. This paper was extremely important because they went at paraffin-fixed, wax-embedded tissue from surgeries many years before. And they were able, with a unique technique, then to, uh, to uh, un- to de-wax the cell, cut it thinly with a cryostat, and to stain it in retrospect. But it captured a moment. It captured a functional moment of the tumor. And KI-67 is indeed an important marker if done correctly. And I will show you the pitfalls. KI-67 is an antibody. And that is, it was raised against a very small piece on a gene of a chromosome that's associated with cell cycle proliferation. So the faster the cell is growing, the more uh, these antigens are present and this antibody can detect it. It's an excellent indicator of tumor proliferation. MIB1 is also a single monoclonal antibody raised against the same KI67 cDNA fragment. Not to be complex, this is the basic principles of radioimmunoassay. It's an antigen or a protein that is, that is stimulated to raise an antibody in a rabbit, goat, chicken, and that antibody then has identical, has recognition to the antigen that it was raised against. That's protein binding uh, kinetics, and that's radioimmunoassay by Yalo and Burson. And that's the, the things that we're starting to get. We did not get this until about the 1980s. 
The term carcinoid was dor the term carcinoid stayed carcinoid typical and atypical from 1907 to the early 80s. You need a microwave to do this. They determined it has to cook for 20 minutes. You use a dilution. But what you need to understand is KI67, the, uh, the, 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 the antibody that's being measured and used widely, is not the same as MIB1. They're interchanged. MIB1 has a, sees a different part of that, uh, that KI67 antigen. It sees a different piece. And it may be that it sees a better piece. It's like any antibody. If you have a nonspecific antibody that doesn't recognize the right part, you don't get high levels. And that's very important. So I think MIB1 is much more specific. It's interchanged with KI67, and the messages are pretty close. Now, to the important part of the KI67 came in the final classification of the typing of endocrine tumors in the World Health Organization textbook Springer Verlag in 2000. I'll show you a picture of the main person on this, but I would call to your attention that one of the two of the nine pathologists, uh, Dr. Kovacs, who I had the honor of working with on a paper many, many years ago from Toronto, Ontario, and Horvath, both at, I think, uh, St. Michael's Hospital, uh, were on that uh, committee at the World Health Organization when the final histologic typing was recommended on behalf of the World Health Organization. And this is Enrico Solcia. Enrico started the terminology in 1980 with very giants in the field of pathology. That'd be Capella, uh, Dr. Uh, Julia M. Pollock, amongst many. And he, in 1980, began the organization of the classification for the World Health Organization which culminated 20 years later in 2000 with the, text, the monograph. And from that now, most of Europe is now, has, has adapted, and I stand to be corrected, the World Health Organization originally using the capella Soltia methods. But it's important because there is some structure or disarray of cells that do prognose. But the functionality now, we know, comes from the staining of the cells, the essence of these cells. And this is what we need to, to, to remember. Dr. Solcier wrote me yesterday. He said, did you see my new paper, Human Pathology? And he had an exclamation, exclamation mark. I was on my third glass of Barolo trying to figure it out. Okay. So I just, I wrote him back and I told him. So, because I'm not a more Barola. Um, the histomorphology, these are, this is a bit, this is where it gets a little like alabaster. It gets a little bit dry, but you just need to know the terminology. The histomorphology part of immunohistomorphologic functionality comes from what was shown by Dr. Warner and described by Dr. Waldering today. In other words, these are, these are a, what, what's the pattern of the cell? What's the pattern of the tumor? What's the pattern of the carcinoma? carcinoma? It's solid, trabecular, glandular. Well differentiated cells. Two classifications are well differentiated. And people ask, what does well differentiated mean? It looks like Dr. Warner's uh, uh, brick wall that's solid with no, with no smudges. The immunostains are critical, alluded to by both Warner and Dr. Waldering, and that is chromogranin A, synaptophysin, in, neuron specific enolase is no longer uh, uh, used, but they establish the essence that these cells, and I must say, sometimes even, and the best example is medullary thyroid cancer, which is really a neuroendocrine cell that secretes calcitonin. It also, uh, and uh, from the thyroid gland, and histologically, some pros say they can measure it, but without calcitonin staining, the diagnosis cannot be firmly established. So it's important to know that these are granules, these are proteins in the cell, but they also relate functionality. They relate well differentiation. They relate differentiation. And the more differentiated well differentiated a tumor or a carcinoma is, the, the more slow growing it is. And why is that? It's because of the, I'll show you the picture of the receptor, the somatostatin receptor subtype. That, that break stop, the, uh, the, the regulator, the grand regulator of these cells. And it's based on that that we have exploitation today. 
The general WHO classification, Lord Hall organization, well-differentiated endocrine tumor, positive chromogranin with synaptophysin, earlier terminology, car typical or carcinoid tumor. That's earlier ter terminology. It's called tumor at the end. Think of the brick wall of Dr. Warner's. Well-differentiated endocrine carcinoma. And now you start having micro, you start seeing invasiveness. It goes through the wall of the propria as we've seen earlier today. And then the third category is the poorly differentiated. And there the mitotic index is high. And there is where we start to see a rationale for hope, I think. Then the other two, which we won't talk to. What's well differentiated endocrine or neuroendocrine tumor? It's a, they're monomorphous. They're the flat brick wall that all look the same. There's no atypical. There's no funny looking cells or nuclei. They grow in the form of nests or trabeculae or restricted to mucosa or submucosa, as was shown by Dr. Warner. They're non angio invasive. They don't get into the vessels. And the mitosis is very low, less than 2%. Well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. That's the grade two of WIC. That's that large gray zone that we all live in, probably, of all my patients. That's the well differentiated carcinoma. And those are the ones that are, 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 that we need to watch their behavior because now we're getting a certain mix of bricks in there. And those are the ones we need to stay, stay very attentive to. It invades the gut wall deeply. And the, and the KI-67 now goes from 2 to 15% in general. But that's a big, gray, proliferative zone. And then there's the poorly differentiated. Highly atypical, small to intermediate size. They grow in large, ill-defined aggregates, et cetera. And their, and their proliferation index by KI-67 exceeds 15%. This is a slide that I've just, to make a simple point, this is a slide from Solchia and their summary of the nine pathologists in 2000. Every single one of those neuroendocrine tumors are staining positive for synaptophysin and positive for chromogranin A, and the site determines oftentimes what amine, what peptide they produce. For instance, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, as Gene alluded to, produces, can produce insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, uh, gastrin, if they're, if they're a fetal cell for gastrinoma, and medullary thyroid cancer. Again, all positive for chromogranin A, all positive for synaptophysin, all saying the same thing. These are differentiated cells. These are slow-growing cells. They are under control from the y lock that we talked about. Here's an example of the well-differentiated carcinoma, atypical malignant, the WIC grade 2. And those cells are nuclear pleomorphism. They're starting to look a little different. They look a little bit like the wall with smudges on it from Dr. Werner. The poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma these are the small or large cell type, also called the WIC grade 3. And you see large, bizarre cells. You see perineural invasion, shown in the circles where the nerve is there, and you can see the tumor around it, surrounding the nerve sheath. And uh, more perineural invasion with the cancer in the nerve. And this is the, uh, the MIB1, showing very clearly, you can all see the black dots. That's how clear a good stain is of KI-67, or in our case at, Ohio, at the University of Iowa, uh, MIB-1. This is the most novel uh, part and aspect that we did not create, Dr. Sue and I, but we did raise a very specific antibody that was highly sensitive to the locks on these neuroendocrine tumors. Shown on your left is normal liver tissue, and over to the right side, is the stain of the tumor. This is a somatostatin receptor subtype stain specific to the somatostatin receptor subtype 2. And as God would have it, neuroendocrine cells and neuroendocrine tumors are replete 92% of the time with this receptor. As the luck would have it, the congener uh, octreotide and landreotide 
uh, both possess an agonism for the SS type uh, T2 receptor. And therein was the exploitation that we started to have several years ago from Europe. There's the membrane staining, which is dark brown, and there's the cytoplasm staining, which is also a light brown, and which tells you something is happening. These receptors are very sophisticated. The peptide locks into, it locks into the lock, and it, it's taken sometimes into the cell and, and, and can live inside the cell and, and act as a, as a source or can act to do an, an, an anti-proliferative, anti-secretory uh, kind of action. So octreotide, lanreotide do the same thing. They go inside the cell and they control proliferation. When you put a picture maker on it, it's called an octrea scan. When you put a Y90 or lutetium on it, it's called a smart bomb. Now, this is the only paper I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes by Fagiano. It was in the Journal of Endocrinologic Investigations in 2000. It just came out. 31 patient tumors with the initial diagnosis referable to the, to the archives were independently evaluated. They were classified by WHO, and the KI-67 was done. Uh, they, this is how they went about uh, characterizing it. They uh, had CGA-positive tumors. 90% um, uh, were synaptophysin positive. Um, uh, synaptophysin was 100% positive. All cases were well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And all patients with that diagnosis with a KI-67 less than 2% were alive at six years. This is the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor with the chromatin brick wall appearance and the chromogranin A staining. And this just makes the point that greater than 15% KI-67 has a bad survival overall than that with the less. Here's the pitfalls. Think of this as a salami. Think of a core biopsy as a salami. You cut, usually the pathologist cut very carefully the first tumor. The primary is cut very carefully and exactly. Look at the marble in that sausage. Then cut it from the back, which is what we get after requesting it four times for the original block. By then we're on the rear end of the sausage. And now you have different modeling. And now you have a different interpretation of the KI-67. So you cannot hang your hat completely on the KI-67, especially when there's been processing done of the original tumor. Striking variability, quality of the antibody titers from batch to batch, within lab variation, these are all things that make interpretation of the KI-67 and the quantitation very difficult. So be very careful and aware and learned and, and when, when, you, when you read and learn and hang your hat on KI-67. Bottom line, Tumors uh, that are positive octrea scan, positive receptors, use somatostatin congeners, consider Y90, LU177, dota octreotide in that group. Poorly differentiated, small cell, consider aggressive chemotherapy. And this is our schema. You'll all have a picture of it in my handout, but now I'm showing you two contrary things. I'm showing you a very well differentiated treatment and chemotherapy and the fit for that was this gentleman that came in about a year, a half a year ago with well-differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, grade 2, proliferation index pushing 15%. On your left side is an octrea scan. Very clearly you can see the tumors. On your right is an, F, uh, an FDG PET scan clearly showing several tumors. Think of Dr. Warner's brick wall with the smudges and the, and the different colored bricks. Now you have two cell populations. Patient went for four cycles of chemotherapy, put him on sandostatin. Six months later, he gained 20 pounds and took a vacation. I haven't heard from him since. This is the last concept. This is the, this is the key fitting into the lock. This is the peptide fitting into its natural receptor on the left. And not to forget that it also works, as Gene says, as a plastic barrier, a bulletproof barrier against the target cell. This is the compound. There's also one called Maritas, which is lanreotide labeled with Y90 from Austria. And this is the concept. The, the injection is in the vein. It goes down to its lots. You saw a picture of the receptors moments ago. It binds to its seven membrane receptor. It's taken into the cell. There's an explosion, a puff, 
and distant to its site of origin, there, there's, a, there's a kill action in all directions. And that cell becomes a source of kill for eight millimeters away or five millimeters away. And that's the tech, that's the theory of the, as Dr. Wolin alluded to, the cytal activity of, of octreotide binding to SST2 carrying a very local beta emitter. I wish to thank you very much for this honor. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, one short question, yes. And, and Dr. Wallen's point is very well taken. He says that the WHO doesn't, it, it, it doesn't quite separate, the, it's like separating fascia. The grade, I told you, well-differentiated tumor is grade one, uh, using the WIT classification. Well-differentiated carcinoma is a separate classification of WHO, which is really the WIT grade two. <coughs> that's why I showed the grade two. And the range is huge, and that's what I was trying to enforce. It's greater than 2%. But it's less than 15%. That's a huge range. Or 20%. It, but the point is, the, 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 the point is, it's not a dep you have to understand what KI-60 says. It's useful. It helps you to guide the therapy. In the case of our gentleman, I used the KI-67 of 18 or 19%. I said, let's do a pet on this guy. And sure enough, it was hot. And sure enough, he responded at that moment to chemotherapy in Sando. There were two populations of cells, exactly what Dr. Wolin says. But, and they do start to dance away from it in their most recent paper by La Rosa. I'll mention it this afternoon in the, in our, uh, with Dr. Van Hoom in our MEN1 section. But they do start to do it differently. They say, well, yeah, we really do have the WHO classification. But the problem is typical carcinoid and atypical carcinoid means nothing to us. We need those, but I am also saying don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because the classification is helpful. I it's think we had to stop the discussion because we can continue for hours with uh, classification. But uh, thank you once more, Tom. Uh, just, just, uh, just a short comment. Uh, at least in Europe, uh, ENET, the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, has tried to improve the WHO classification by doing the new TNM and uh, grading uh, classification which has came out for different subtypes of tumors in neuroendocrinology. So, and we have tested this new classification system in several types of tumors, both endocrine pancreatic tumors and carcinoid tumors, and it seems to work uh, also in the praxis in the clinic. So uh, if one is uh, very interested in classification, you can, please, you can read these new uh, papers. I think we take now 15 minutes uh, coffee break, and then uh, please come back yeah, uh, not longer than 15 minutes. Thank you.